My maternal grandmother, Lucy Pantera, was the fashion icon in her family. She had the finest taste, her home was exquisite and beautiful, and she loved nothing more than spending an afternoon with my mother or sister at Bergdorf Goodman or at the Bell Harbor shops in Florida. Appearance was important to her and she expected us to look our very best. As a teenager growing up in the 90s, drawn to grunge and alternative rock music, I saw fashion as about materialism and conformity, and so I rejected it, at times wearing things specifically to upset my mother and grandmother. I remember my mother taking me to a Prada store to try to buy me something and me insisting that the only item I would let her buy me was this powder blue puffer vest. And at other times I remember giving in and saying, just tell me what you want me to wear and I'll just wear it. But I definitely refused to have an opinion. My wife Tali took over this frustrating job when we became married. I am a bit older now and my Baba Lucy passed away just over a year ago. Reflecting on her life pushed me to reconsider shunning fashion. And much like the movie Oscar with Sylvester Stallone, I have spent the last year in earnest trying to up my clothing game in her memory, which for me has meant to dress in a way which shows kavod, honor, a sense of taking the occasion seriously. I have tried to stop wearing Lululemon pants and on cloud sneakers to work and synagogue and have opted instead for more dress shoes and sports jackets. I have found this year that there is a joy in getting dressed up a bit nicer. Although I've also discovered that wearing tight dress pants does make it harder for me to play on the floor with the kids at a Shabbat meal or to spontaneously join them in a game of basketball. And as someone who takes his Judaism seriously, I have also started to notice the ways in which fashion and clothing are everywhere in our tradition. The Torah tells us what to wear. God commands us to fasten tzitzit, fringes, to the corners of our garments, and even tells us that the color of one string on each fringe should be tchelet, a shade of blue. The Torah goes into great detail about the clothing of the Kohanim, the priests, and the high priest, the Kohen Gadol, who goes through more outfit changes on Yom Kippur than a host at the Oscars. Our tradition also tells us how to get dressed. If you open up the Shulchan Aruch, the central legal code of our people, written by Yosef Cairo in Sfat in the 1500s, one of the first laws you will read about is titled, The Laws of Putting on Your Clothing, including the law that we are to put on our right shoe first, then our left shoe, and then to tie the left shoe, and then to tie the right shoe, and that we always remove the left shoe first. And we see the role of clothing in our stories. Joseph's technicolor dream coat causes jealousy among his peers and brothers. And on Purim, we read of Mordechai's rags to riches, switching from mourning the potential destruction of the Jewish people in sackcloth to wearing royal robes when our fortunes are reversed. Rabbi Yisrael Salanter, the founder of the Musser movement, the Jewish approach to character development, writes that one tool we can use to improve our Jewish paths is to look to Chochmat HaOlam, the wisdom of the world, and to incorporate that knowledge into our lives. In thinking about someone who might shed some insights, some wisdom of the world into understanding fashion, clothing, and getting dressed, and also how they might enhance our Jewish experience, I thought of our guest today, Leandra Medine Cohen. At only 21 years old, Leandra launched the Man Repeller, a blog about fashion trends that, in her words, women love and men hate, which launched her to international fame and influence in the fashion and social media world and became a media company that she led for 10 years, showcasing her rare combination of an eye for fashion, the ability to write eloquently and reflectively, and a great sense of humor. Today, she continues to channel her gifts through a newsletter called The Serial Isle, which is about how to have fun with your clothes on. We first got to know each other when we had an opportunity to study Torah together at the home of our mutual friend, Sandra de Capua. I learned so much from her that day, and I can't wait to learn from her today. Hi, Leandra. Hello. So great to have you here. Likewise. Really, I feel really. like I have to offer the disclaimer that I thought this was a podcast, and that's why I look like this. <laughs> so, yeah, it, uh, it's a good test. We tricked you. We wanted to see how you get dressed when you thought you wouldn't be on TV. I would have probably worn the same thing, maybe a different shirt under this, but I would have had chapstick. I at least would have had chapstick with me. Okay. All right. That's good to know. So tell me first. Let's just start there. How does what does getting dressed look like for you? Um, what does getting dressed look like for me? My relationship to getting dressed feels much more spiritual than it does technical. When I think about getting dressed, what I'm really thinking about is this first interaction that I have with myself in a day. And so depending on when that happens, which is usually after I take my kids to school, but sometimes before, and when it is before, it, it actually tends to launch that early morning hour into a more peaceful, 
or like harmonious span of time. Um, right, explain that to me. You're saying when, when you get dressed before you take them to school, it makes it more peaceful? Yeah, there's, Why? Some, there's something about... I feel like it's so hectic if I'm trying to get dressed I know, before but I get if, them out. If I, if I make the time to actually get dressed before I even go into their room to get mm. them up for school, there's something about the presentation and having gone through the process of connecting to myself, because that is what getting dressed feels like to me, is connecting with myself and making a decision about how I'm going to present myself to the world that day. Um, there's something, there's something really validating and empowering about walking into their room and saying, okay, I'm ready, now you get ready. I love it, so explain that to me a little bit. You know, because for me, getting dressed is like, you know, a little bit checking a box, you know, blue shirts on weekdays, white shirts on Shabbat, and that's it for me. How is, how is it about connecting to yourself when you get dressed? I think I've always used clothes as a way to better understand myself. Um, I grew up in New York, but both of my parents are immigrants from the Middle East. My mom is from Iran and my dad is from Turkey and they both came here in the 80s and you know me and my older brother were born in the 80s so we kind of navigated America at the same pace at the same time. Mm. And um, I have three brothers and no sisters and I think that these qualities have contributed to this basic underlying feeling that I've always had that I'm kind of alone and nobody gets me. And uh, clothes have really helped me figure out how to express myself. I would say that like if for the first 10 years of my life I was like, what is this? Who am I? Where am I? Clothes really helped me start to peel back the layers of those daunting questions. That's so interesting because I, I would almost think of it the other way that like clothing can sometimes hide. Clothing can sometimes put up barriers, but you're saying it, it by, by wearing certain clothes, it allows you to send a message to yourself or send a message to others? Like, give me an example. Talk me through to that. To both. Yeah. yeah. I think there's a bit of, I always say that, that getting dressed is sort of like a moving meditation. So it helps you move through the muck of, you know, whatever was on your mind the night before, if you're doing it in the morning or whatever's on your mind at the moment. It's sort of like figuring out a math equation. You go into your closet and you're like, okay, I, I want to feel good today, have to fulfill the practical duty of being comfortable because I'm going to be spending my day with the kids. I also know that I want to feel like myself and it's important that I do it through this like exterior process. Um, but what's interesting, I was recently interviewing a mother in the UK for a feature that I run on my newsletter called What Do Moms Really Wear? And she said something that really resonated with me or no, you know what, it wasn't her, it was, it was another, um, it was actually, interestingly, a Mexican woman who lives in my neighborhood who's converting to Judaism right cool. now. And she was telling me that she, she never really resonated with the concept of clothes being protective gear or armor. You know, we so often talk about clothes as armor, but they're actually heart openers for her. Mm -hmm. And it really stayed with me. And I was like, that's, that's totally right. The feeling of nailing an outfit is your heart expanding. It's almost more vulnerable. It's more generous than getting dressed to conceal yourself. Wow, okay. And so I love that. So talk me through, uh, so I think I'm starting to get a sense. So you, in the morning, you're kind of like, you have this like, you're looking at your closet, let's say, right? And you have some sense of the different things you're trying to pick out. And then it's about the combination of them, but it's also there's like certain things that you want to make sure it, it, it checks, right? It's like you mentioned comfort for that particular day. That kind yeah. of thing. So then- It's like the practical limitations. What's the weather like? What am I doing today? Right. How do I need to feel from mm -hmm. a technical perspective? And then the, emotional pieces or, and the psychic pieces. Great, so tell me, give me some examples, you know, looking at the Jewish calendar. Well, actually, let's start with Perm. So Perm is the idea of, you know, we, people dress up for a costume. Do you, are you a costume wearer on Perm or were you? Uh, yeah, I used to love wearing costumes on Perm. What would, do you have memories of, you know, one where you felt like you nailed it in the way that you just described? You know what, I have a very clear memory of my mom dress, going as a gypsy to a Purim party one year and my mom dressing me up and she just like wrapped me in different like Iranian scarves and shawls and put this head covering on me, this silk scarf on my head and huge gold earrings in my ears and I was wearing uh, really dark lipstick and I felt so awesome before I left. And when I got to the party, I was like, oh, everyone bought their costumes from a store. <laughs> this is so different. 
I, I guess that's an example of what I mean yeah. when I say I, I like always felt so alone. Yeah. Okay. And it also feels like a good foreshadow in the movie of your life. Yeah. That everyone else is you know buying off the rack and you're you're putting all these things together and doing something uh, yeah. different and impressive. How like, was the reaction? Do you, were people into it? I don't even know. Okay. I was so embarrassed. I felt oh. so off. <laughs> um, but that is that is a very memorable Purim costume. Got it. And, and was that you know going back to that time? Were you always kind of you mentioned age 10, were you always into fashion and getting dressed? Were you like standing out already in middle school, dressing differently? Like, you know, how did the fashion journey develop? I don't, I, I don't know how to answer that question. I'm not really sure how it developed, but I know that whenever I had free time, I was thinking of ways to wear things. And it was always about how I wear things, not necessarily what I wore. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting because I see it in my daughters now. I have one daughter who really likes stuff. You know, she'll go into my closet and take out the shoes and say, can you keep these for when I get bigger? And I like this top and I like these earrings. It's like, it's very specific things that she mm -hmm. gravitates towards. Whereas the other daughter is really creative about it. Mm -hmm. Like she'll take a scarf and put it on her head and then put a headband over it and then take a pair of like pink flare pants and put orange corduroy shirt shorts over it. And it's so not about the yeah. stuff so much as it is the expression mm -hmm. and I, I mean, they reflect very different parts of my own experience and how I think about it, because I care a lot about the actual garments and mm -hmm. I care a lot about the actual how. Um, but I guess because of the limitations of having been a kid, most of the time I spent when I was young was like, let me figure out how to take these 10 garments I own and spin them into 100 outfits. Wow. That's so interesting. Yeah. I, I, um, uh, first of all, it's interesting that like it sounds like you know as as it should be. Each, each of your daughters got a bit of of you in them, yeah. which is always nice to see. So I think you raised for me something that's you know certainly we think about in our home, which is like the act of getting the, the children dressed for school a little bit. I know there's always like you know I feel like in our home there's a, there's a certain age where we let them wear whatever they want because we don't want to fight, and at a certain age either they become more self conscious or we make them more self conscious, <laughs> and suddenly it's like there's a more narrow lane of what they could or should wear to school. Yeah. Um, like is it like anything goes, wear whatever you want, and I'll stay out of your way? How do you navigate that? You know, it's really funny because sometimes I hear myself saying things to them like that doesn't match with that. Um, and I often wonder to myself if I'm doing something wrong when I say things like that, but I usually follow it up with, and I do believe this, you have to learn the rules before you can break them mm -hmm. because when you break them, you do it in a meaningful way. Um, and, and I say that to them too. So I, like a lot of things go, but if something is really off, I will put my foot down. God, they so wear a uniform to school though, so I'm uh, also not really thinking about their clothes very much. Right. Well, what about like, you know, those those bigger moments, let's say that you're going to Shabbat services or it's the Passover Seder or like some kind of holiday where the family's gathering, are you picking out the outfits for them or they're coming in with scarfs on their head and four headbands and that whole there thing? There are definitely four headbands at the beginning. Yeah. I, I would say that I we pick out the outfits together. Mm -hmm. we, we concept the vibe yeah. <laughs> together. <laughs> And then, um, yeah, they each put their little spins on it. That's cool. Do you use that language with them? Like, Vibe. Or like, what's our concept? Like, do you get meta about getting dressed with them? I don't know. Not what's our concept, but I like the vibe yeah. will, will be said. I mean, I'll do that with Judaism. I'll kind of be like, let's zoom out. Let's remember, like, I know you feel amazing right now. Who should you thank? Thank Hashem. Like, I'll try right. to, like, you know, use whatever I have to share the small amount that I do to kind of like, and I, you bring so much to that. So it's interesting to imagine that. Okay. So you're like laying it out for them. And is it, you know, for both you and them, is it a we decide this the night before or it's in, in the moment? It depends on the occasion. Sometimes okay. it's decided like a month before. Got it, if it's like something for big. for Rosh Hashanah. We're picking it out. Yeah, they're getting new outfits and here are Got your it. clothes yeah, for yeah. the year. Right, right. exactly, fine. <laughs> so talk fun. me through a little bit around, you know, your approach, you know, I think holidays are, you know, holidays are our fashion week for lack of a better term, right? There are mm -hmm. these kind of peak moments. I think of the Seder, I think of Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, even every Shabbat, um, you know, are you- I actually did a newsletter on this one. Oh, really? Yeah. All right, so I won't ask the question, share a little, what are your reflections on it a little bit? Well, no, I, I had taken a picture of myself before Rosh Hashanah like two years ago and I sent it to my friend Alana Newhouse mm -hmm. and I was like, I think the high holiday Holidays are fashion week for Jews <laughs> and she was like I think that's right and then I was like I'm gonna turn this into a newsletter it resonated with like 15 people like the oh. 15 <laughs> Jews who go to shul on the holidays um, but it's true because it's it's when you go so the thing about getting dressed for fashion week is that you're really dressing for your peers you're thinking about yourself and you want to feel good but there's something really satisfying about um, 
receiving a compliment from someone you respect. Mm -hmm. And I, that's okay. Mm -hmm. I think that's a good thing. Sure. Or it just, it is what it is. And the same, the same dynamic is at play when you're getting ready for shul because you're running into peers, other moms, other, you know, friends, your parents, their friends, whatever it is. And so you want, you want to present yourself in such a way that you're proud of. Mm -hmm. um, and I find that there's something really beautiful about that. I, my relationship to style is, really not cynical like I, I see I understand the the negative the negative impact that clothes can have on a person but I don't dwell on them too much because I have such an open and freeing and healing relationship to getting dressed mm -hmm. and I think avoiding or not continuing to perpetuate and push that agenda is in a way denying someone their own process. Yeah. Like if it's really upsetting you that I care about clothes the way I do, that says something about your relationship to it, not mine. Mm. And so there's something really meaningful also about letting someone sit with their feelings and have that process if they're willing to. Well. Whoa, I'm sitting with that for a second myself. Uh, you're yeah, giving me some right. therapy uh, that's as, right. as I'm reflecting back. All those backwards. years that you hated clothes. <laughs> well, it did, it did. It struck me as kind of like, we should be focused on the inside and not the outside. You know, uh, you know uh, why should we be wearing like clothes? I, brands was the worst. I think I fought so hard. I was like, it cannot say the name of a brand on any clothing of mine. Because I, you know, I don't want the idea of certain brands being more expensive or being a marketing tool for other brands. Those like really rubbed me in ways that I was like very averse to them. Did you grow up in an environment where brands were weaponized as opposed to necessarily mm. used for expression, for like creative? Yeah, so I, I, I'll say, I think I would argue that maybe the 90s in general, culturally, there was kind of like, in, in the culture was a sense that brands were weapons. Like they always, you know, made fun of the people with f fancier brands on TV right. was kind of the setup. But I want to hear the second half of your question, which is like, how can using brands be a positive thing? Talk me through that for a second. Well, because if you're using the clothes from the brands mm -hmm. as opposed to the mere fact that it's just a brand, mm -hmm. you're you have a different agenda. You're, you're doing something else with the product. Mm. Um, it's funny because when I moved uptown, one of the things, and I, I feel, I, I say this with a grain of salt because I love living uptown and I love my neighbors and I love the people I see on the streets every day, but I distinctly remember having this feeling of, I don't wanna move into this environment where fancy things are weaponized. You know, like a gold watch is worn just so passerbys, passersby can see, you know, that you own this $30,000 piece of jewelry versus sure. you love how it looks and it's, it's kind of a bracelet that completes your vibe. So that you know? super resonates. Just to clarify, we're talking about the upper uh, uptown in Manhattan. Yes. Um, so I I'll say that the way I navigate that is like sentimentality, like mm -hmm. very deeply. Like I was, you know, I didn't, I didn't want to buy a Rangers jersey because I had Rangers jerseys from my childhood, but then I got one that had like Adam Fox on the back, who's a Jewish player, and I got a patch of number seven who had passed away last year, who was my mother's favorite player, yeah. and it felt like this like thing connecting me. And similarly, I remember when I got married, like uh, my wife's parents wanted to buy me a watch, and I was like, I'm not getting a watch, but then we, um, you know, it became the sentimental thing that's from them, from mm -hmm. the time of my marriage. So that feels like I found a way in, but I feel like that's basically as wide. You know, my lanes are, it's comfortable, or my lane is, it's sentimental. Yeah. Uh, and like, you're, there's much more, I assume, going on in those two lanes? What are like the other lanes for you that like help you? Like, how do you connect to, to clothing in that way? Well, to, to the point that you were making before about it matters what's inside, when you nail an outfit, mm -hmm. and what I mean is when, you, when you're able to reflect a version of yourself that feels like in essence true mm. like that like the i call it the spiritual twin set it's mm. so when your inner self matches your outer self oh, i like that <laughs> yeah the inside it, like the outside great it um it can really open you up mm. 
you know, like, yes, what matters in it does, what is inside does matter. And it's okay to have that reflected on the outside. Interesting. Is it, is it's it okay harder? to care. Right. It's okay to care, which I think that's also part of, I think, especially the 90s, as I, you know, I'm, I'm having therapy here looking back, it was all focused on like, let me prove how much I don't care by spending three years looking through bins at thrift stores to find the right thing to wear to show you that this was from my closet, even though it's not from my closet. So okay interesting. Yeah. By the way, I think I see that. Did with, all of your friends wear brands? Um, I don't know that, I think, again, I think it was more in the culture than my school, let's mm -hmm. say, but I think that, and, and by the way, I did, I remember I had like, I had this like, my mom also took me to the diesel store, but I didn't want to wear anything that said diesel, so I, had, I found this one gray sweatshirt that looked like tattered, that looked like it could be from a thrift store, even though it was diesel, and then I like wore it every single day, but I was wearing a brand without anyone knowing it, so I yeah. think that like, um, but you're making me feel like I'm the exception and not the rule, which is interesting. Well, you know what's interesting is I felt so different when I was growing up that like I would have died for my mom to take me to the diesel store, mm. or I have these memories of like begging her to take me to Infinity, which was a right. store on the Upper East Side, and get a pair of hardtail pants right and you know she'd look at the pants and be like I'm not spending $65 on right. this ribbed garbage mm -hmm. and all I wanted was to look like the kids in my school right. to look like my friends right wow. Rose Goldberg yeah queen of hardtail <laughs> <laughs> she looked so cool all the time 100% um, that's great and all I wanted back then yeah. was to fit in right and, and I wanted to use clothes to do right. that too that's so interesting. We like, you know, mm -hmm. we're all a response to what's around us. You know what I'm really curious about? I didn't know that, or why in the Shulchan Aruch do we have to tie our left shoe first? Yeah, so uh, we, right, put on our right, right and then, then left, left and then, then tie left, left and right. right. So there is, so what's very interesting, one of the favorite things for me about the Jewish tradition is that our consistently, our most famous halachicists, our legal writers, are also our biggest Kabbalists. So there's some kind of weird combination between the people who write the laws, which feels very stiff, you think of like American law, yeah. or the people that are like also the, like the equivalent of like, I don't want to say rock stars, so it's not, music's a different genre than Kabbalah, but, Kabbalah, but spiritual thinking about. Yeah. So I think that there's probably um, elements of things happening on Kabbalistic levels, but I'll say on a, on a less Kabbalistic level, because I'm not yet a Kabbalist, I haven't gotten the tap on the shoulder yet, maybe mm -hmm. one day someone will tell me the tradition, uh, is that uh, specifically, I think your question was the left, but I'll start with the right. I think the right is consistently um, uh, associated with strength, so that's why we start with the right, to start with strength, and then tying, we tie our tefillin on the left arm, so I think it's a similar idea that we're leaning into this idea we do tying on the left side. That's, yeah, that's what the Mishnah Brewer says, which is a commentary on the Shulchan Aruch, but um, I don't know. I know that my kids love it, by the way. It's, talk about, it's like, I can't get them to put their socks on, but they're like, oh, I have to put on my shoes the Jewish way. Um, and they do it, they take it seriously. Well, right is masculine, left is feminine. So okay. there might also be something, and right. right is the side of giving and left is the side of receiving. Taking. Interesting. So okay. I wonder if there's something to that too. Cool. All right, huh. so we're getting into it a little bit here. Yeah. There you go. I know, that's, uh, there's probably something there as well. I wonder, so we start with giving and we end with taking or something like that. Mm -hmm. We start with receiving. Yeah, sorry, sorry, we start receiving yeah. and, then, and then, yeah, that's interesting. Well, I guess because you do need to load yourself up for the day first right. in order to be able to give. Oh, that's interesting. Okay. I like that. Now we have a mindset. You'll, you'll, you'll be more put your oxygen when you're mask on your, first. Uh, yeah, when you're putting your perfect outfit, not, when you nail your outfit, you'll, maybe you'll think about the order you put your shoes on. It's uh, interesting. Yeah. Got a new tradition. Here we Gotta go. Got to make sure all my shoes have laces <laughs> yeah. from now on. So actually, it's funny, the Mishnah Brewer writes there, we're really getting to the weeds now, um, that in nowadays, shoes don't have laces anymore. Um, but it's funny because now, I mean, I think of shoes as having laces, but you're right, yeah. not all shoes have laces. Yeah, sneakers do. For sure. And these gold tap shoes I'm wearing right. do. <laughs> I don't know if we can get them on Only camera. Bullshit. There we go. There we go. <laughs> See, you did know you were going to be on TV today. There you go. Uh, that's great. By the way, shoes are such a thing for me also because I feel like I, this is, I guess, also a thing that's unique to me. I think it must be the exception that like I get very uncomfortable in most shoes. And so I'm always focusing on finding the most comfortable shoe. But I feel like I make massive um, sacrifices for fashion when I do that. Um, my wife got very mad at me because I got caught wearing on clouds on this show once. I didn't realize there would be a Why wide shot. Why is that shot. bad? Because uh, I was wearing like this clothes and a pair of like on cloud you sneakers. Like it, was yeah. it was a snow day that day. And so I came in in my on cloud like snow. You came uh, out in your YK look. <laughs> All right, so what's your, what's your YK look? So, uh, well, even like backing up for a second, like, do you, do you, as you think about preparing for Yom Kippur or Rosh Hashanah or Passover, which is not the same as Fashion Week, but are those big moments, do you, are you, do you like lean into the themes of that day? Like, is there, is there something about the Jewish calendar that like directs what you're looking for around that time for any of the holidays? 
I think maybe for Rosh Hashanah because the energy. I'm Sephardic, by the way. Mm -hmm. That's why I sound like I speak very authentic Hebrew when I'm. And, we, and you said Iran and Turkey, right? Yeah. So that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. I'd say so. Rosh Hashanah. Yes. Um, <laughs> That's a funny thing about my husband is Syrian, mm -hmm. and they they have such strong Brooklyn accents, right. so many of them. But when Hebrew words come out of their mouth, it's like all of a sudden they're fluent in Arabic. Right, you know, right, it'll be right. like, well, "How was your day? It sounds crazy. Did you read about what Jacob did?" <laughs> <laughs> By the way, that, I want to hear Yom Kippur in a second, but that raises for me also, like, I guess if I was trying to be more idealistic about um, the, 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 the fashion piece that, like, you know, we can't help the way we speak, right, in some mm -hmm. ways. You can, I mean, you can. There are actors and actresses that change, and there are people that kind of lose accents over time, but there's some element of, like, you know, these things influence you and it shapes yeah, the way we right. speak. So I think there's some element of, like, I mean, I guess you would argue that you, we shouldn't only be a reflection of our surroundings when we get dressed up. We should, like, know the rules and then break them, let's say. Know the rules is and it, then break them for sure, but I, I it's also... The is there like a beshert? Is there like, I want to say that word beshert, might be confusing, but is there like a, you know, like the same way there's a person you're meant to marry, is there like an outfit you're meant to be wearing that day that like, and do you get it or don't get it? No, I don't think so. Okay. It's so, yes, rules, break them, sure, but it's like clothes and getting dressed is also a, like a, a, a really low stakes and what I mean is like it's a it's a common denominator that a lot of people can relate to. It's a low stakes way to get to know yourself better, mm -hmm. to like start your own hero's journey. It really what is. is it, what does that mean? Hero's journey. Do you, Do you know what the hero's journey no. is? So the hero's journey is this is this cycle of time. It's this loop that many of us live in. Um, where you come full circle. You know, you start you start in this one place and then you experience pain suffering, uh, the vulnerability that comes with that, you, you go inward, you find the truth, you commit to the truth, you develop resilience, and then you're whole again. Cool. You know, you, you reconnect to your integrity. Mm -hmm. And um, creative enterprises, like getting dressed, like cooking, like making music, like listening to music, are really meaningful, low common denomina denominator ways that people can explore whatever is ailing them and come out the other side. Cool. I mean, I think about it so much with Man Repeller and the end of that business. I closed my business in 2020 during the pandemic. Okay. And um, experienced a pretty ugly public fall you know, it, like I, I, I endured a real public disgrace. Mm -hmm. And I've been thinking back to that time a lot lately because I'm four and a half months pregnant and my body is changing. And so through this process, I'm having to learn a whole new way to get dressed. Mm -hmm. And there's something quite identity shattering about not being able to fit into this reflection you have of yourself. Mm -hmm but also something really empowering about pushing yourself to find a new reflection. Mm -hmm. And there's a nostalgia about this time post Man Repeller when I was so depressed and I had these young kids and we were in the middle of a pandemic and my life felt so small and my self-worth was suffering so much mm -hmm. um, where the only thing that genuinely could get me out of bed to show up in the world was getting dressed. And I feel like it really reinvigorated my relationship to clothes and style because it became so much, it just, or it really reinforced and uh, validated for me that it was more about clothes and it has always been more about clothes. I always sensed it, but when I was doing Man Repeller, I had access to so much, mm -hmm. you know, the, the company had become so popular and um, I was very well liked by brands and I, I really had access to whatever I could have wanted. And so it's really easy to lose yourself in that access. Mm -hmm. And so the, the aftermath of that really proved to me that it's not about the access, it's not ego. It's mm -hmm. so much more about finding myself and connecting to myself and um, pushing myself out the door in a way. Whoa, so like, okay, thank you for sharing that. Yeah. So much that I want to unpack from what you just said. Um, let's start with the last thing you mentioned, we'll work our way backwards. So, you know, um, 
we read last week uh, in the Torah portion the idea of the of the Egel Hazahav. This, so we have the, the golden calf, this moment where the Jewish people have access, let's call it. They are at Mount Sinai. They connect to God. That's the most access they ever had. They're at the foot of the mountain. And then the next day, things go terrible, right? And um, What do we do with all this right, freedom? Right, exactly. Well, yeah, let's immediately do that. So, you know, you know, like looking back through it, so how do you think you manage, like you, you being that close to the sun, let's say, you know, like are there lessons that you felt you learned from that or things you would have used the access differently or did you feel like you used it well? Like what, you know, what do you make of, of let's call it that access? It's so, I like that you mentioned Chet HaEgel mm -hmm. because I remember when I was between Man Repeller and my newsletter, it was, it was like the Passover between that time, or maybe I'd actually started my newsletter, but it was the very beginning. And it was, yeah, it was Pesach, and I was walking to my in-laws house with my husband, and I asked him what he values more, his freedom or what he does with it. Mm -hmm. And I ended up writing an essay about it, because I, I was like, I've actually never thought about this, mm -hmm. but like, what is even the point of having freedom if you don't know how to use it? Mm -hmm. If you don't even realize that it's there. Right. But part of having freedom is also recognizing that the onus is on you to cultivate discipline and to maintain focus, to stay close to yourself and to stay true. Because if you don't, you will, you'll leak. You will literally leak. You'll turn mm -hmm. into a puddle of melted gold. Right, right. I, I, I like that metaphor also. It's really interesting to think about in almost that language of like, you could almost insert, think about access to your language with freedom a little bit. Like, okay, were you the most free when you were running Man Repeller, or were you the least free when you were running Man Absolutely Repeller? Absolutely the least. Yeah. Like on paper, I was the most free, right. but internally I was the least free. Right. I used to, you know, it's, I, I went through the notes in my iPhone. This is also like, you know, post Man Repeller when I was reflecting on my life. My journals from that time will become right. a book one day. But I had this note in my phone from 2013, and it was just a question, and it was, can you love your life but hate yourself? Mm. Like that, that is where I had gone. Wow. Because I didn't, I wasn't acting in integrity. Mm -hmm. I, the discipline and the focus that is required to sustain your like, moral fiber, your character, it, w it was just so easy to, to cloud it because those sounds are so quiet they're like whispers and then the ego is like more 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 it's coming it's coming just keep taking mm -hmm. so it's, it makes me reminds me of like the book mesilat yasharim the, uh, which is a famous musa book, which is like literally the the straight and narrow path is the best way to describe that yeah. and like how do you stay on that narrow bridge and not like you said use the language of leaking or come off and so if you were if you were to try to summarize what the narrow bridge is for you like what's the narrow bridge if you push away all the clutter and the you know the fame and the power and the access like what's the thing that you feel like you're deeply trying to do i was just talking to a friend about this actually and so it feels fresh in my mind but i am in consistent pursuit of understanding how and why close maintain such a spiritual quality in my life. Mm. That is always what I wanted to know, and it changes with seasons and what's coming up in my life. And when I became a mother, there was a huge explosion of new information. And the same thing happened when I became a wife, but I was younger and much more immature and a bit avoidant then. Sure. It like scared me more than anything else. And now with this new baby coming, I'm sure it's gonna launch something else. Mm. And. Um, that's super interesting. So you're bringing up for me, uh, I remember having a conversation with another mutual friend of ours, Claire Distenfeld Olshan, I assume is a mutual friend of both of ours. Uh, I, I don't- She's more like a sister. Yeah, there you go. So I was either at Mikey's wedding or maybe it was at Caroline's wedding, but I remember we ended up at a table having a conversation and she kind of framed um, trends in fashion as like the idea that like, one is always building off of the one before and that each you know each new generation each new season you're trying you're continuing the conversation yeah it's like and that was like over a minute yeah so, so and that to me like I, that hit me so I, obviously i'm on some kind of journey trying to under to, to make peace with fashion and to me it was like that's judaism right the, the whole jewish tradition is we know we start with you know moshe at, at har sinai and we're coming you know each generation is evolving and adding and whether it's like a new understanding of the parsha or it's a new uh, evolving of the legal code like we're, we're, it's like, it feels like an eternal conversation that's constantly building upon yourself. Mm -hmm. And also, if you show up to the conversation and don't know anything that came before you, it's like, 
you know, you, you need to have done that work. Um, so I, I guess the question I'm trying to get to here a little bit around is like, let's, I guess let's talk about well, you can respond to that imagery as well, but also I think there's something around trends that is interesting to me also, because you didn't mention trends there, but you're famous for that person who's kind of either noticing the trends, setting the trends, people are seeing what you're doing mm -hmm. and doing it. So like, what, what, what are trends? Why are they interesting? Like, talk to me about trends. It's so funny, because I kind of feel like we live in a post-trend world, but it's not really post-trend so much as it is like the way that trends are being set now is really different. We're not all listening to the runway and getting all the information from what the glossy magazines tell us. Right, the there's power so has much, yeah. To use that word again, there's so much more access. Right. And yeah, the power has really diversified and um, expanded. And so many people consider themselves experts and so many people have become experts mm -hmm. and you don't, the the barriers to entry are different and um, the process of achieving the status of expert is not the same and I think because there is no straight and narrow path to commanding the big audience the the sort of outcome that you get is much more varied. Mm -hmm. But even before we even get to that even thinking on a personal level you you, you frame kind of this this path of yours mm -hmm. so kind of like you know when I play volleyball and like the ball's about to go out and I dive and save it it I feel this like rush of adrenaline and I feel like you know you wrote a, a post this week about um, the, per, the, the 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 personality hat right so you're you are identifying a trend and at the same time someone else I saw wrote an article about you kind of like pointing out the ways you influence some of the lines that came out during uh, during fashion week right yeah. so do you like you know, or, or, do you like get juice from that? Is it like kind of like I caught that trend first or do you feel like, wow, here's a trend I started and someone's following it? Like, how do you relate to the trend part? Because you talked about getting yourself dressed, but now right. there's like this other part about yeah. the game. I think that anyone has the power to do it. Like, I, I, I acknowledge and recognize that I have a, like a pretty wide influence and a large impact mm -hmm. and it's evident in implicit and very apparent ways, but I think any, I genuinely think anyone can do it because what people are actually attracted to is the, the confidence mm -hmm. that, and, and like the, the sense of like authenticity, the honesty that's evident in a look that you put together. Mm -hmm. And I think th that's just always been my, my North Star, is like if it feels good, you share it. If it doesn't, you don't. And then if, if, if does, does you catching the trend early mm -hmm. or does you, or do you seeing other people follow a trend that you set, does, does that fit into the part of the narrow path or is that more in the like no, access that's confusion more ego. space? It is more ego. Yeah. Got it. And but did you feel like, you know, I remember like being young, talk about growing up in the 90s with music when like if I discovered a band before my friends, and I was like wearing their shirt, it felt like cool, but if everyone was listening to it already, it was like, Yeah, or you cares? know what, I, Is it like, yours I guess you, yeah. getting credit feels yeah. like more ego, you know, mm -hmm. like that. Lauren Sherman, who writes a, a very well-read industry newsletter, is who gave me that compliment about the shows being uh, very influenced by my style. That, that was like a very nice, ego stroke and I, I was really, really happy to read it and so grateful that she had put it out. Um, but then I guess the part that does fit on the path is that like wearing the clothes and participating in the trends and in instances creating the trends is also like bringing more joy into the process of getting dressed. Mm -hmm. And if I can help people do that and like help them find freedom inside of their own people while they're getting dressed. Mm -hmm. That's so the point. Interesting. And so I guess I was watching, there's like a, this is way out in the left field, but I was watching Because a few, yeah, so, yeah, that rush that you get yeah. when you're playing volleyball, yeah. it's the same as the rush you get when you put on an outfit and it feels kind of risky, but you're like, I don't care, I nailed it, I'm going out. And right. the response being like, you look so cool. Mm. And I know that I've been able to give that to people in the past, plenty of times. Sure. And and yes, that is that's the whole point. Great. So let, then let's talk about people's experience of you for a second. So I think you know you mentioned before kind of that you know what's behind what's going on online. But there's this element of you know we live in an era that people sit on their phones and scroll all day and are looking at what other people are doing. My guess is that more often it makes them feel 
less good than more good. Um, and certainly, you know, if your advice is for people to try to nail their outfits, how do you how do you present that in a way where people aren't just going to try to copy what you're doing and instead are going to learn the ability to to do it themselves? Because I think you're saying the joy and so much of fashion is about people kind of following trends. So how do you say mm -hmm. how do you how do you express to them and give them the tools to think about getting themselves dressed in in their own way instead of kind of being like, let me see what everyone's showing and I'm going to copy all those things. It's giving them more formulas than recipes. And Explain. I, yeah, and I do more. that, I do that on the newsletter a lot is like the equation is not blue shirt plus red pants plus green hat plus yellow shoes equals outfit. Mm -hmm. It's something on top that feels like a, like a risk plus really reliable bottom. So something that you know feels comfortable and safe to you on the bottom plus, uh, shoes that you wear when you want to feel powerful and confident mm -hmm. equals like what you wear on a date because mm -hmm. you want to you want to give yourself the rush of taking the, the risk mm -hmm. but you also want to know that you are in something familiar and dependable and comfortable because that gives you the confidence of like historical data mm -hmm. and then you put something on that makes you feel powerful and that's usually an accessory because it's easier i love that is that for men also or is that for women I for, know, it totally applies for, for both. What's the, what's the man for? I feel like I remember going to Tokyo uh, with my cousin many, many years ago and just being, and this is literally, I think, 2007, I don't know what it's like today, and being like blown away by like the diverse fashion there. Yeah. That, like it wasn't like you're, oh, everyone's wearing a suit, they're just changing their tie or they're wearing a different color sport jacket. Being like, wow, they really express themselves yeah. here. Like, is the, is the male world just, is it is it more limited or is am I not, am I? No, male fashion is getting really interesting. I would argue that it's more interesting than women's wear in recent seasons like in the last five years it's so much more fun to cover the men's shows and to follow the men's shows than it is to follow the women's shows okay but yeah those those cues are not I, by younger generations they are they're being assumed by like all the men mm -hmm. but older generations are definitely it definitely feels a little bit more I was gonna say formulaic <laughs> But that's funny because I called it a formula <laughs> right, versus right. a recipe. It, it it feels a little bit more box checky. Right, right. Okay. And then is there, like, it, it brings me to that point also, which is, you know, uh, the idea that there's nothing new under the sun, right? Mm -hmm. Is there, like, it, it, does it feel like at the end of the day, you, like, you can only push it so far, but we're going to keep coming back and back to circles? And is that a good thing? Or is it like, no, actually... It's creative, so it can be, maybe it's not. Maybe creative creativity can go further. I just like, who decided that everything has to be new all the time? Yeah. You know, like mm -hmm. I, that, that's, that's the question that I often find myself asking. Like, mm -hmm. who cares if the wheel is reinvented or mm -hmm. not? Again, people are attracted to genuineness and authenticity and honesty. And, and when those qualities are reflected, it is unique. No matter what. Right. There's there's only one version. Yeah. Each human is only one version of this outfit. Unless you're <laughs> copying the outfit that you saw on Instagram last night and bought all the but pieces. But even so, it. if you're replicating it in your own way, it's, right. it's still, it's like not really a replication. It's right. your interpretation. Right. Okay. And then let's let's look at Perm just for a couple minutes also. So it's kind of the way that like Rashi and Rambam and Unclus can all have a take, mm -hmm. a hot take on yeah. the same pasuk. Yeah. It's the same thing. Right. Well, that, that goes back to the Claire conversation a little bit, which is, you know, can we, can we, it's an eternal conversation. There's an element of pushing it forward and looking at it differently. Yeah. That's why I think, you know, I'm very focused on kind of approaching each holiday, each year with like a fresh set of eyes. Like, you know, what have I learned from the last, you know, 40 perms and what do I have for this perm? Yeah. Um, and that's that. And so I feel like it's a little bit similar to that as well. And these things come back around and then, you know. I love when I get permission from Todd to wear things that I've had for way too long and should be out of my closet and they're back in. So I'm like, <laughs> yes, getting, getting some, some mileage out of this. Um, so let's just talk a couple of minutes about perm. You know, we mentioned costumes before. I think one of the kind of themes of perm is the idea of like Hester Panim, the idea that like the face is hidden, that like, you know, everything you know is the opposite, turning things upside down. Um, and so you mentioned a little bit around how getting dressed can, can flip a day for you, which mm -hmm. I wasn't expecting you to say. Um, but I wonder also, you know, to what extent can you, do we communicate messages through our clothes to other people? And, you know, to the extent they're sometimes sincere or not sincere, right? We can, you know, be having the worst day ever and put on an outfit that makes us feel like everything's together. And then we could also be having the best day ever and, you know, 
it, that kind of thing. So do, like, to what extent does the message to others from our clothing, you know, how does that play out? You can't really control how other people receive. receive it's art. Yeah. You can't really control how they receive the outfit, but there's definitely a thing about, a friend of mine gave me a really nice compliment recently, actually, where she was like, you're one of the only influencers I know who, like, I, I never feel envy when I see something on you. I love a lot of the things you wear and I buy a lot of the things you wear, but I never look at your page and think to myself, like, why does she have that and not me? Mm -hmm. And I told her that it's because I spent a lot of time thinking about the difference between showing and sharing. Mm -hmm. And I never wanted to be the kind of person who showed. And so I think that when the, the message is about showing, it's about I can buy the $30,000 watch too, mm. and you know we're wearing the same sneakers, we're the same kind of person, um, it, feels, it feels a little more grating mm. than when you can tell that someone is really, and Claire is actually a perfect example of this. Like, she is just oozing self mm. all the time. Mm. Like, you don't even actually know what she's wearing. She's just being Claire. Wow. Uh, by the way, what, this is bringing up for me the idea of being a baltzfila or a chazan. So I'll translate those baltzfila, like the person who's leading the prayers versus mm -hmm. a chazan, which brings up the idea of kind of like more cantorial. And not, right. not that those things are different. You can be, a, you can be called a chazan and be a baltzfila or be a baltzfila and be a chazan. But just this idea of showing versus sharing. Sometimes you have those moments where someone's kind of performing prayer and right. you're watching. Right. And then you have the moments where it feels like someone's like, bringing you in to the service that they're doing with them. And it feels a little less like, why is their voice good or I can't keep up? And more like yeah. I'm, I'm going on a journey with them in some way. That's interesting. Okay, and then, but like, talk me through, you know, we have Mordechai here who has this moment where he thinks the Jewish people are, are done and he's like wearing sackcloth. And then we have the reversal of fortune and he's wearing like royal robes. You know, we, for better or worse, we get invited to those moments, right? Mm -hmm. Those like the funeral the super sad funeral, all those kinds of things. So then how do you navigate that as well? Like, are you like, I wanna show up in a way that expresses being somber, but I also wanna be myself, but do I wanna attract attention to myself when I'm going to pay a shiva call? Like, talk me through something like that. What's that experience like? I mean, I think we have those moments even when we're going through our own dark nights of the soul. Mm -hmm. Like, there were definitely weeks where I, I post Man Repeller, where I wasn't thinking about what I was wearing. I put on the same, like, jean shorts and t-shirt every it was the summer every single day you know and it just like it didn't even occur to me mm -hmm. and then i knew something flipped when i woke up one morning and i was like i need to get dressed today mm -hmm. um when when you have the practical limitations of like this comes back to the practical limitations okay i'm going to a funeral i, I want to look respectful and i also want to reflect um like how i want to be perceived mm -hmm. which i guess for me would be as someone who cares about their appearance is interested in fashion, um, you you sort of do the same thing where you're like, okay, it's a funeral. I know I want to wear muted colors. This is mm -hmm. not a place where I wear like lime green and mm -hmm. bright pink. And I know I want to feel respectful both to myself and to the environment. Maybe I'll wear a flare pant. Flare pants are in right now. Mm -hmm. Put a headband on. I don't frequently wear headbands, mm -hmm. but it'll make me feel like I'm doing something, mm. it's, it's that. Got it. And then, you know, coming back to kind of, you know, the, the, the ending days of the Man Repeller, just say a little bit, you shared a little bit around kind of the lesson you took with yourself personally. Mm -hmm. Like, did that also shape, you know, I think we live in a, I'll use the frame, language cancel culture, culture. Mm -hmm. Like, did you, you know, are you at peace with the world after that? Like, what are your, you know? I'm at peace with, yeah, I'm 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 at I'm at peace with the fact that th how do I say this? Cuz so much of my experience felt like a precursor to what we experienced on October 7th. Mm. And I felt really I felt like appropriately armed to handle that from a social mm -hmm. perspective because of my cancellation. So much of it felt um, I wouldn't say so Jewish, mm -hmm. but it was a lot of criticism about my values, mm -hmm. and those values are innately Jewish. Mm -hmm. There's a sort of uh, there's a sort of stoicism about which is like kind of ironic and funny yeah. about um, about Jewish values and the the sort of like lack of victim mentality for as much as we complain to each other. 
we never show that face to the world mm. um, that that really misaligned with the way the culture was moving has is moving mm. and so I would say that I'm at peace with the fact that the Jewish experience is uniquely different from the culture uh, the, the culture of the diaspora wow wait so i want to just make sure i understand this you're saying because i'm you know holocaust survivor grandchildren so it's very much like let's make sure we're not victims again but there's a big victim mentality for sure you're saying a little bit in the american jewish experience like we're we're not focusing on the victim narrative we're focusing on presenting strong successful that kind of thing and then we've seen like a move towards self-identifying as victims and kind of like a separation of the victims and the and the inflictor that's what you're saying, and you feel like, wow. But we're also not actually victims because we do what we need to do right. when we have to do it. Mm. I mean, like in 1948, I'm sure that the Jews of the time would have wanted way more land than they got, but mm. they took what they mm. what they got mm. and they built. Mm. Right. You so, know, there's so an element of like stop complaining and do it being being raised yeah. to make the best mm. of what you're being given mm -hmm. and like to find the blessing in it and to find the gratitude in it yeah i mean we got man's search for meaning out of the holocaust right, right, right. that's crazy One of my <laughs> transformational <favorite> yeah. <laughs> text hi um that's great um wait so you so i, I want to talk about october 7th and i want to go back a little bit so i think you know one of the stories i was told growing up was after um the six-day war in 1967 kind of you know men went from wearing caps in public to wearing kippahs there was kind of this moment of like it's proud to publicly be a jew because there was like this messianic moment that kind of thing mm -hmm. and now we've seen kind of I'll call them fashion trends since October 7th, right? Especially the among same women, thing is right? Happening. Yeah, well, men with kippahs, but also, right, so yeah, let's see what you're, what are you rocking today? I'm just wearing a little Star of David. Right, so do we see the, the, the Stars of but David like, coming out? I've got a diamond Israel flag bracelet. Right, 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 right. I've seen, <laughs> I've seen um, people have this, this, the map of Israel with like a diamond in it or not a yeah. diamond in it, but there's all this kind of like jewelry, and of course, the, you know, they bring them home, mm -hmm. and you know, the piece of tape that says how many days, like there's all of this fashion expression, and it's certainly common among men but I feel like especially among women talk to me a little bit around like kind of what you're seeing what you think it means long term of like women representing Jewishly trends um, yeah let's start with there there's also this beautiful thing about it where like whether we want to acknowledge it and look at it or not there's a matriarchy and there's a patriarchy there are gifts that women have and gifts that men have and maybe in the instance specifically of this conflict you know Well, that doesn't quite make sense, but part of part of the expression through fashion feels like an innately feminine quality. It's a mm. thing that women can do mm. to support and show solidarity. Mm. Um, and I think there's something like really beautiful and kind of ancient about it. Mm. It just it reminds me of of my mom's upbringing and her family and. There are lives in first Mashhad, which is where originally her family's from, and then in Tehran, and you know how everything was about the production to get to Friday night, mm -hmm. and the way that they would show off their jewelry to each other and cook together, and there's something so beautiful and spiritual about it, and I feel that same vibe. It's like, the, like I feel the same softness inside mm -hmm. when I think about the women making the Star of David necklaces and wearing the necklaces and putting on the tape and the Am Yisrael Chai sweaters. Mm -hmm. Like it just, it feels, um, it feels so much bigger and more emotional than the actual thing. Mm -hmm. And say, and you know, I know our synagogue, for example, has had like women driven trips where it's like led by women, it's all yeah. women. There's like a, a, like a, a female approach to going to Israel right now and like going to be there. Like from where you're sitting, what do you see as like, what's the unique female experience of thinking about what's happened since October 7th? Yeah, my husband was just on a mission and he came back and one of his <clears throat> like banner takeaways was that this is truly a trip that every Jewish woman should go on. Like this is a woman's issue because there's been so much denial of the pain that Jewish women have had to endure over the last five months. Mm -hmm. And so, like, I don't think we're ever gonna get public validation for the amount of, like, rape and pain that has been bequeathed mm -hmm. to the women mm -hmm. of 
to, to us, to our people, and, and also the loss of all the children. Mm -hmm. I mean, th that impacts both parents, of course, mm -hmm. but you know, there's, there's something about the connection between a mother and their child that is different, not better or worse, more intense or anything like that. It's just u uniquely different mm -hmm. because of the way that a child is brought into the world. Mm -hmm. I mean, I remember after October 7th, I was on a business trip in Europe and all I wanted to do was get home and like put my children back in my uterus mm -hmm. because it felt like the only safe place. Right. You know? Yeah. That's, I mean, that, that brings us back to Mordechai again, this, this element. I remember also, I was in Paris once with Tali, and I remember someone going to synagogue, and there was no Eruv there, the, the mechanism that allows you to carry, so he wore his talit, um, his, his prayer shawl, mm -hmm. but he hid it under his jacket completely. Everything was closed up because he didn't want to walk in the streets with that, right? And this element of uh, being so uh, not comfortable you know, you talked about being comfortable in your skin, put, nailing that outfit. So, you know, there's things we choose, but there's things that are like built into our DNA. You wear a tzitzit, you wear a talit, mm -hmm. you wear a kippah in that moment of like, okay, so what pressure are you putting on yourself when you feel scared to walk out into the world and be Jewish? And then yeah. also like, what does a moment represent when even despite the fear, you have these people that are going out into the world and saying, no, no, I'm proud to be Jewish. And the victory and relief that you feel when that's, responded to well. Like I remember right after October 7th, we were sitting at a diner, it must have been like two weeks later, and there was a kid sitting with his family at the table behind us and he was wearing an IDF sweatshirt. Mm -hmm. And AB made a point to go over and say, great sweatshirt. Mm -hmm. And so I, I think doing those things makes a really big difference mm -hmm. because you, you get reinforced in the risk that you took. It gives you confidence to keep being yourself. Right, right, it all comes back. <laughs> it all comes back, I'm getting it. You're teaching me slowly. I think I'm starting to get it, which is like, you know, can you be, can, the same I think of integrity and trying to strive for integrity in, in behavior and actions, mm -hmm. can you have integrity in the way that you present yourself to the world in a way that reflects who you are and reflects out into the world something that yeah. It reflects what you want to be sending out. And again, it's really, it's really scary and really hard right now because the culture is reflecting a completely different perspective. Mm -hmm. And if you don't get on board with that perspective, you're a genocide supporter and you're happy about the amount, the death toll in mm -hmm. Gaza. And, mm -hmm. you know, none of those things are true. Two things can be true at once. Right. You know, you right. can absolutely believe that two nations deserve to live in safety on the same land. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's, I'm gonna close us with one more question, which mm -hmm. is, you know, uh, I'll, you know, certainly, Bezrat Hashem, please God, you, you have you know, a baby expecting and that baby should come, and I, I hope that that gives us all hope, that any Jewish human, but I'll, I'll push you further and just say like, in this moment, sitting where you sit, what gives you hope? I know I took your answer. <laughs> well, no, you d I... <laughs> or one of your answers, I should say, sorry. I always have hope. Mm. Like, it's, it's such like a bleak and gray and dark life to live without faith. Mm -hmm. and, and hope is sort of like the way that faith is turned into action. Um, so what gives me faith? Just like, staying close, being... The, the, the more time I spend in my integrity and, you know, doing what I say I'm going to do and meaning it and okay. fighting for my cause, mm. the more faith I have. Mm. And getting dressed in the morning. <laughs> I, yeah, I guess that's part. I guess so. I'm learning that from you, for sure. <laughs> getting um, dressed helps. Yeah. Um, Leandra, thank you so much. It's My really been pleasure. such a pleasure to have you here today. I feel like we could talk for five more hours. Um, I, I hope it goes well. I hope you feel good, and I thank look you. forward to continuing to learn from you. Yeah. Thank you so much. And just repeat for us the name of the your newsletter on Substack. Uh, the newsletter is called The Serial Isle, and the URL is leandramcohen.substack.com. Great. Thank you so much, Leandra. Thank you. Okay.